much beginning with this segment after the promise is starting around verse 4. And what I want to look for are the promises. I just called uh, verses 1 through 9 the travel stories, right? It's positioning Abraham where God wants him to be. So from Haran down into Canaan. Do you see the promise in that story? your descendants, I'll give you this land. It's a land story. That's exactly right. Literally, physically, Abraham is locating in the land. And listen, don't underestimate the significance of that. You're thinking, oh, wow, I need to come to class to hear that. But, but his <laughs> proximity in the land becomes important to some of these other stories that develop as we go through this segment. One thing I want to call your attention to, do you notice... As he gets into the land, he keeps stopping and doing something. Do you see that? Yes. So interestingly, in a relatively short segment, that is said twice. Look at verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So build an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then again in verse number 8, he lands in Bethel. And it says there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Curious, where do you think that little detail gets such emphasis? It shows Abram's commitment to serving God. And gratefulness. What do you think he's grateful for? God's protection and taking him to where he was supposed to be. Yeah, so, 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 so even in just the movement from Haran down into Canaan, he is seeing the hand of God and beginning to fulfill the promise. And here's the thing I think is important, which you'll see. In response to that, what does Abraham do? Yeah, he worships. It's not just that he builds some stone memorial to this. The altar is for the purpose of him worshiping God. I want you to see that because, because I am convinced that one of the drivers of legitimate worship is gratitude. I think if you look for that biblically over and over again, it is people who are grateful to God, who are driven to want to honor and worship Him. So just a little side application being you. It drives us to worship. And is, is that under underneath there, that gratitude and thanksgiving for what God's done for me? See Abraham doing that. Yes, sir? I think something we might kind of overestimate or take for granted now is how many people would die on that trip. Okay. Just making a travel back in those days, um, it was extremely deadly. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it, is it like today with interstates and rest stops and Chick-fil-A? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, those journeys were extraordinarily tough. As, as we illustrated with the route earlier, right? They had to take a route not for the straightest distance, but for the sake of where I could find provisions and live. And through occupied land. Uh, yeah, you, you, oh, yes. And, and, and the people become... People become a problem at times in all of that. So the rest of chapter 12, after getting him there, is consumed with this little side trek into Egypt. So that's another story, 10 through 20, not a Bible class story, as we said earlier, uh, but an interesting story about Abraham going west and into Egypt. Let's talk a little bit about why did that, why does he do that? Famine. Now there's a severe famine, which was also a problem back in the world at that time, and so and so he moves west to to do what? I just why does Egypt always have food? I mean, it just seems to always work out that way. They'll tell the story that everyone else is having fun, famine. Egypt has food, and so they go there. They go there to get food, and while he's there, he has problems. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Evidently, evidently, not only is Sarah, I need to be careful, I'm on video, really, really, attra really attractive, right? But she's got, like, longevity in her attractiveness. Because she's going to be attractive for a long, long time, and this is going to continue to be a problem, right? And so, what's that? 
good bone structure. Uh, <laughs> I try to really be careful here because I'm really worried about getting in trouble. Because I think this is just such a fascinating part of the story. So, so he lies and, and and covers up the fact that she's his wife. How does that work out? It's not good. Uh, if, not good for anybody, right? <coughs> Pharaoh takes her. Pharaoh gets in trouble. Pharaoh fights. And, and you know, all so much detail is missing here. Cause, I mean, like this could be a mini series on Netflix about <laughs> how all of this came down. What what happened here? But but the short of it is, Pharaoh finds out. Pharaoh's mad. Pharaoh kicks, kicks him out of Egypt, and, <coughs> and he goes back where? Okay, so here's my question: Why is this story here? Well, first of all, he doesn't trust in God's promise. Okay. okay, so so I think we miss that sometimes. Should be bulletproof um, or spirit proof or whatever that day. So <laughs> here's the thing I want you to remember all the way through these stories. God has made Abraham a promise that requires an heir. So if God is true, Abraham cannot die until fathers a child which is the drama of 12 through 21 if you want to just put an umbrella over all of this just label it child drama because ultimately we keep coming back to that problem again and again and again that's a detail though that Moses puts in chapter 11 verse 30 he said Sarah was a not his wife was a bear. yes no child and so and so the issue here really with the famine is would you trust God to take care of me in a famine in Canaan? And the answer is no. They try to fix the problem themselves by going to Egypt and by covering up. By the way, did he have to worry about anyone in Egypt killing him? No. He but this wasn't. isn't the last time he's going to like... No, no, like, I know. And that's he's what's still going to learn from this. He still keeps going with it. Like, okay, so, how many times are you just not going to do the thing? Okay, right? so does it not give you all faith that Abraham just takes so long to get it, mm -hmm. right? I, it really, really research me. So, so let me get this thought out. So, so he goes to Egypt, not trusting God would protect him from the famine, and he lies about Sarah, not believing God would protect him from the enemies. This is, the story is about Abraham, well... It illustrates Abraham not trusting God. That's part of it. But connected to the promise. What's the connection to the promise? Or does it? Well, yeah, because even Pharaoh believes it. I will curse those who harm you. Even Pharaoh believes it so, more than Abraham does. So the blessing and curse promise yeah. is back? And he's like, get out of here. I, again, I think it's about the land, too. <clears throat> he's supposed to stay in the land. And he's not doing that. And it's about the child, the heir. Does he believe God's going to provide the heir? Yes, sir. I, I think it's also, you know, we, as we've mentioned multiple times, think about who we're writing to, right? Wrap them in. I they, think they're here too. They know. They know their own story, right? They know where they're coming from. <coughs> and out of Egypt. They're coming out of Egypt, and they know Joseph's story about everybody coming down because of a famine. And so you have this other story. It's like, oh, you mean that just a couple generations before this exact same thing happened <laughs> before? And it, it, it's kind of it's kind of a, a nudge. And it's like, and you guys keep complaining, saying, let's go back to Egypt where we had everything good. It's like, what's wrong with you? Look at what look at what's going to happen in this story. And it's it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself. And and so the, the Israelites know this at this point. Interestingly, on the trip, what are they complaining about? No food. No food. God can't take care of Listen, God can wipe out the Egyptian armies in the Red Sea. God just brought us out to the wilderness to die. What, what sense does that make? And so, yes, I think there is a message here for the Exodus crowd. When you don't trust God and you go on your own, what do you do? You make messes. That's exactly right. Oh, I wonder if we need to hear that. When you don't trust God, when you go on your own, what do you do? Uh, Isn't that the whole history of the Jewish nation? <laughs> <laughs> and yet, even oh, when it was Abraham's fear, oh, yes, the fear. definitely driven by fear. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's the same reason why they're wandering in the wilderness because they let their fear. They did. Yes, ma'am. Yet even when we're boneheads, 
and make a mess of things, God is still faithful to promises he's uh, He still keeps it. That's exactly right. All right, I'm going to press on and watch my TV go away. Hey, I gave you coffee Saturday. You didn't take care of me. Okay, chapter 13, we get the story of Lot and the land, which I'm going to call episode one of the Sodom story. There are three parts of that, and really at this point, we're being set up for the Sodom story, which also I think is really, really important. So, so the story of 13 is Abraham and Lot have some trouble dwelling close to each other because the herds are too big, right? And so they decide they need to part company, and, uh, and uh, Abraham gives Lot the choice to choose, and he chooses the well-watered plains of the... He chooses the best area, okay? It's kind of like when there are two slices of pizza, and you know which one, you, he picked the bigger slice. That's, a, that's what kind of guy he's being. Which makes me wonder a little about blessings and curses. Is he kind of, is he kind of doing his, his father-in-law who's taking some, he's kind of doing him dirty here? I don't know, I have to think about that one a little bit. But, uh, but it's not going to work out well. All we know is we're told, that it's, it's, it's kind of like um, that cliffhanger at the end of the episode. You get the end of this episode, and what we're told is, the city of Sodom was exceedingly wicked. Not that they were bad people, they were exceedingly bad. And that's sort of, you know, think of somber music now setting up as, uh, as that scene begins to close. The most obvious reason for me uh, that the Lot story is here is for the wanderers. I want you to think about that. This Sodom story comes to us in three episodes, right? There's going to be an episode with the, the Battle of the Kings that Lot gets caught up in, and then there's going to be the destruction episode. And so I've really pondered that, thinking back to the promises and all that. Why is Lot here? And I think the most obvious example is Lot is supposed to teach a lesson to the Israelites in the wilderness. What would the lesson be? What do you think? This Sorry. is not going to be what you're what you're talking about, but okay, then don't say it. Okay, <laughs> then, then I won't say no, it. No, 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 go ahead. Well, uh, if we if we jump really far forward, you get to Numbers 23, and those people are doing the exact same thing. They are staying on the east side of the river because that is the place where they want to to. I don't mess with them big people in Canaan. Well, but they want to they want to raise their their cattle and, and and all of that kind of stuff, and and. Famously, Numbers 32, uh, 23, 32, you know, if, if you don't do what you say you're going to do and help us take the land, then be sure your sin will find you out. Right. That, that whole idea comes from that. And so I think it's, it's very possible that this section here was added later to, to say, hey, listen, look. This is a this is a thing. I, I don't know if there's anything that says that Moses had to have written it all in specific order, but you get you get all the way to that point, and it's like, eh, maybe maybe there's something there. Um, okay. But but you have you have this this constant picking of sides, and, and anyway. I I'm wondering I'm wondering about something even more basic about okay. Lot and Sodom and something the Israelites needed to learn as they went into the promised land. What has Lot just done? He's mixed in with another group of people. He's moved, well, he's moved that direction. And before we're done, where is he going to be? Living in among them. And before the story is finished, what happens? He's pulled out. Yeah, what happens to his family? He winds up being corrupted by the people in which he finds himself. And so think about what happens with the Israelites when they go into the promised land. What are they told to do with the inhabitants? Because if you don't, they're going to corrupt you. So think about this being written to the people who are going there to do that. What a vivid reminder. You do, you do not want to fail to do this job because if you let those people remain and you mix with them, they are going to corrupt you. And by the way, what did they wind up doing? They let the people remain and they mixed with them and it corrupted them. You've been very patient. Thank you. Well, I was just going to say it. This section also tells them where these people have come from. 
who they're going to be dealing with as they make this trip. And like Moab and Ammon, they're not noble people. They're born out of sin. You know, kind of reinforcing the purity of God's people. Yeah, so so I, I really think it's helpful to think about the audience of Genesis, the people who received it. I think some of this stuff is placed there with them in mind to prepare them for what they're about to do. So at the end of 13, now let me throw that up on the slide. This is just at the very tail end of that chapter. Uh, I labeled this section the promise rehearsed because four or five times through these stories, that's actually what you have God do. God pauses and he comes back to Abram and he says, let me remind you what I'm going to do for him. So uh, for you, verse 14, for example, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and uh, look at the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I will give to you. So now what promise are we talking about? The land promise is repeated, verse 16, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. We didn't add dust to our list. Sand, stars, and dust, which is what promise being revisited. Now it's the nation promise being revisited. And so after this episode where Lot kind of takes advantage of him, God comes back on the scene and said, look around. It's all good. It's all good. You give it to your family. Interestingly, as we go through these stories again and again and again, we see God doing that, coming back and reminding him of the promise, reminding him what he's going to do for him. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Well, and even by Abram giving Lot the choice, he's showing he's trusting God with the blessing. Abram then yeah, tried to take is. the best for himself. He said, you know, you, you can have it. I'm good. So, so Abraham just drives me nuts through this <laughs> segment. I'm serious about that. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, is, is he a good guy? Does he trust God? Or does he not trust God? And so, and so let me kind of jump ahead because we will almost certainly run out of time um, and say this to you. I think Abraham is the poster child for real faith. And one of the things I love about his story here is that his faith looks like mine. I'm going to tell you, in the, the decades that I have been a Christian, I have had some great moments where I have done exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. Sometimes it was hard to do that. And then I have had some colossal failures that I'm so embarrassed about, I would never want you to know. And I just think, what kind of disciple am I? And I read this story, I think, I'm one just like Abraham. You know, you got these moments, moments where you do great, and then you have the moments where you're down in Egypt say, hey, you need to lie because someone's going to kill me. What's that about? Where'd that come from? It's an example, I think, of real faith. And by the way, we're going to just, in next class, get into some really cool things about, uh, about how this faith does eventually grow <coughs> and get stronger. So let me jump ahead and talk about chapter 14, where we have the next Sodom story. Uh, this time, uh, Lot gets caught up in a local conflict, and, um, and some kings come in, and they mess with Lot. They haul him off in his stuff. And uh, when they mess with Lot, who are they messing with? They're messing with the family. And there were some promises about that, right? So what happens if you mess with the family? Your nuts are not going to work out good for you. So Abraham gets some of his servants together. How big was his household at that? I mean, he gathers his own people, and uh, they go back out and get Lot and bring it back home. The interesting part of the story, I, I think we're kind of captivated by the battles and stuff. I don't think that's the interesting part of the story. The interesting part of the story is what happens with all that's over. And we meet two people. Who are they? Melchizedek comes on the scene. And there's another character there who shows up when it's over. Did I lose you? The king of Sodom yeah. shows up. What an interesting contrast they are. Melchizedek comes up and he blesses Abraham. And what does he receive? What does Melchizedek receive? 
a blessing from Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And so the king of Sodom shows up, and he starts, well, he, he acts like he won the battle. He's like, okay, okay, you can keep the possessions, give me back my people. And Abraham's like, dude, I don't want anything. And you're not the one in charge, anyway. This is all about the war. Interesting contrast there, good guys and bad guys, when you get to the end of the story. Great example, though, I think, of the blessing and the curse and how that's working out. Now, you get to 15, and we have another one of these segments where the promise is renewed. But 15, 15 is absolutely bizarre, right? Do y'all remember this story? Notice it opens with Abraham struggling with his faith. You think if you went out and looked up on some kings and God gave you the victory, your faith would be really strong. But you get to this chapter in 51, God says, do not fear Abraham, I am a shield to you, your reward will be great. And his pushback is what? How can my reward be great when I don't have an heir? And then he brings up someone in verse two. He brings up Eliezer, a servant in his house. Why is Eliezer important? What's, what's he got to do with this? Why is Abraham bringing him up? You see that? <coughs> if I don't have an heir, yeah. then Eliezer is going to have to inherit. So, so, so are you saying that this slave in my house is going to be my heir? And what does God say about that? Yeah, look at verse 4. This man will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body will be your heir. I think that's really important. Again, more child drama that runs all the way through here. we got to have an heir for Abraham. What's interesting about this, though, is every step of the way, God starts telling him a little more and a little more and a little more, right? He's already said to him, through your seed, all families of the earth be blessed. And now he's saying, from your own body, not your heir is going to come. And as we press into this, he gives more and more details. Uh, the interesting thing at the close of this is that God covenants with him about this. Did y'all read this segment at the end where, where he has him slaughter the animals and lay them out? And then this, don't ask me to describe this, it, it calls it an oven and a torch. So... So I kind of see a frigid air and, and a flashlight <laughs> going through the bed. I, I don't get it. I don't get the picture. So, 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 but that, that's what happens. It comes in between those, and you just read that and think, "Wow, oh, it's right there." I said about. But evidently, it, it was a way of covenanting with someone and saying, uh, "May this be done to me." What's happened to these animals? May this be done to me if I don't do what I say I'm going to do? What it is? It's God's affirming. I'm going to do. What I promise to do. Okay? So, again and again, that renewal of the promise is made all the way through the second. Okay, then in 16, new players, Hagar and Ishmael. So, is this a good moment for Abraham? So, why does Hagar, a random service, Servant in the house become important. Okay, so yeah, so understand underneath everything that happens now, chapter sixteen is the belief that we need to help God with this. Okay, that well, and, and by the way, let's be fair to this. Um, you know, we're just reading one chapter after another. They were living this day by day, and it isn't like three months had gone by. This is years and years and years of passing. And Sarah's not pregnant, and and he doesn't have an heir, and they are old. And they're just thinking, this isn't going to work. And so you can almost hear the conversation over dinner, put an awkward conversation as we um, Maybe God has something else in mind. Maybe he's going to be from your body but not my body, so maybe I need to give you my handmaid. I didn't say anything about that as a wife, and and maybe she will produce the heir. How did that work out? You should have said that. 
we're still warring today yeah. because wow. of this. Wow. Yeah. So, so I'm not going down the polygamy path tonight. Just know <laughs> that every time people actually did it in the Bible, it was bad when you start. And, 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 and how quickly does this one have to go bad? Yeah. yeah, when Hagar gets pregnant, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mess right there from the beginning. And so, um, I, you know, again, don't miss the underlying struggle. They're just not trusting God here. And so now, ongoing, we're going to have that Hagar and Ishmael issue that's going to continue to be a struggle for Abraham because, again, he didn't trust God. He did his own thing, and it didn't work out. And again, I'm thinking about the wonders. Because they are going to have to trust God in some bizarre circumstances. Okay, here's the plan. I want you to take everybody, go march around the city. For six days, march around one time, come back, camp. And then on the seventh day, march around seven times and shout in the walls are going to fall. That would have been my reaction exactly. You have got to be kidding me. That's the plan? Who came up with that? See, he was going to ask him to do that. Like, an elderly woman. Had but in looking at them taking, you know, the golden cap, they're taking matters into their own hands about things that in the moment seem so reasonable to them because they're gone off the rails. And I think this is one of those moments that we do this. Like we start thinking, well, this isn't going like I thought, so maybe if I do this and maybe if I do this and, and things Thank just you. spin out of control. Exactly. 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 I think that's how Sarah got to this point. Like she didn't, they didn't, like you said, it's been years. It's not like she woke up and they like, well, we've tried like a couple of times and this just isn't happening. So okay. let's just, like it's years and years and like clearly we're too old. Like this has been years of them. And then I can see. Have something else in mind. There's got to be something because I can see how she would get herself to I the point too. that like, you know, and you know, Abram, he was talking to you, like your family, maybe it's just not for me. Right. That's it. Maybe I'm not a part of this. If he made that promise to you maybe and not me, so let's just help this along okay. or. That brings us to 17. Because we have another problem. And then he tries to, yeah, and then again, every time things go off the rails, he comes back. Well, that brings us to another promise renewal. The, 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 the critical piece in this, in verse 1, is what? Look at verse 1. He's almost to three digits at this point. <laughs> By the way, how old was he when he came into the land? 75. Okay, so it isn't like four years have gone by. Twenty-five years almost have passed. He still doesn't have an heir. And the thing with Hagar did not work out. And so once again, the promise is revisited. You have the nation promise and the land promise. What I think is really significant in 17 is later in the chapter we get more detail about the child. Remember, we started with, I'm going to give you an heir, and then the heir is going to come from your body, and then after trying the whole Hagar thing, look, look at verse 16, talking about Sarah, God says, I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she will be the mother of nations, and kings and peoples will come from her. So, God now gives us more details about the child that's coming so there's no misunderstanding the child is going to come from Sarah one other really important thing that happens in 17 name change. oh there are the name changes oh, well, that's a big deal because Abraham is father of multitude which just reinforces the fact I'm going to do it exactly every time someone called his name he would think God said that I was thinking about something else so. The circumcision. That's what Circum so, so, so circumcision is instituted here. Um, it's interesting, the last time they had this kind of renewal ceremony, God did something. He did the demonstration. And now he's requiring something of Abraham, which I think is a sign of great faith. I mean, he just goes out immediately. And uh, boy, if there were ever a, a, a time to delay a procedure, this would have been. <laughs> and he does. He goes out immediately. And all his sons uh, submit to circumcision. So that's that's practice is instituted here as well. Okay. So then we get to then we get to 18, and the promise is rehearsed again. Although this time under interesting circumstances. What's the setup here in 18? Get some visitors. I have so many questions. Because it's like it's like he knows, right? He immediately sees the visitors and it's like he knows, hey, this isn't just three random dudes who showed up. 
like there's something special about that. I know you're going to wonder around the path of who this is and, uh, and and how he knew, and I don't know. I don't know how he knew. Uh, I just know that he does. But the added promise element here that I think is really important is in verse 10. Can you see it? Yes, Sarah will have a son, but something else is told her for the first time. Oh, next year, within a year. Yeah, next year, I will visit her. At this time next year, behold, your wife will have a son. And I do love Sarah's reaction to that. Fat chance. <laughs> and what's more funny, she gets called out for it and denies it. Like God doesn't know what, he's doing, what she's doing. So uh, I, I like, again, thinking of the wanderers um, about God's ability to do the episode. Right? And God's ability to know what you're doing and thinking. <laughs> oh right there. You know exactly. That's, exactly. That's exactly. The gripers needed to know about that for sure, didn't they? Okay, so then we move on to 18, the latter part of 18, and what we have there is the final Sodom story. So this is the part of the story where God actually actually destroys Sodom. Again, think about the wanderers and the important lesson about being corrupted by the people. I think that's why this story is here. There are some interesting things that take place, though, as, as Moses tell this story, tells this story. Uh, one interesting episode to me is Abraham's negotiation. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember Abraham negotiating with God? Yeah. Fine. What does he do? Fine. Got, got down to 10. Yeah. yeah, he starts with 50, and he argues God down, if I can find 10 righteous people, <coughs> will you spare the city? And of course, the fact that the city wasn't spared tells you, tells you what? He couldn't even find 10. Yeah, couldn't even find 10. One of the things it does is it plays up the, the, the merciful nature of the God we serve, that God is fair and God is just. And again, thinking about the wanderers, they would need to remember that as they went up, that the, the work they were doing to drive out the Canaanites is because their wickedness was now full and it was time to drive them out. It also reinforces, I mean, we go back to Noah, there is a, God has, there's a limit. There or is. There's like, okay, there's going to come, and so in the, for us, there's going to come a time when God is, I'm done, it's time to destroy the earth. I hear, I hear a couple of, 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 of flood echoes here. For example, why 10? You ever thought about that? Why does he whittle him down to 10 and stop? Who was saved on the ark? Eight. Who? Noah. Noah and his immediate family. And depending on how you read what we're told about Lot's family, I think a case can be made that he certainly had at least 10 immediate family members. I am suspicious that Abraham tries to whittle God down to Lot's family, just like Noah's family. Will you save Sodom for 10 for Lot? And the sad thing about that is not even lots. Okay, we've got to move quickly because we've got out of town. And we've got to throw out of time. We've got to throw a Bimelech story in there, right? Yeah, I know you are laughing. But the Bimelech story is a replay of Egypt. It's Egypt again. It's like watching a show and saying, didn't we already see this episode? Didn't this already <laughs> happen before? The bad thing here, though, is now we're within less than a year of the birth of the child. And so it's interesting if you read that story, being delicate with a mixed class. God makes sure that Abimelech and Sarah do not ever get together. Because if they had, what problem do you have? Yeah, now whose who's child is this really? And so lastly, we get to chapter 21 and verses, the first eight verses, where Isaac is born. So now we have the heir, and the emphasis there, really cool, is all on how God did he did that exactly as he said he was going to. Then you have the brief story, let me just throw these up there, of how there's a separation made with Ishmael. I think that's all about God distinguishing his heir and making sure there's no confusion. And then one last story, Abimelech reappears. But he appears for a great reason. Abimelech demonstrates 
the blessing and the pers- curse promise. He's been on both sides of it. He gets cursed when he takes Sarah, right? But then he figures out, ooh, this guy is with God. And so he decides, well, we need to buddy up with Abraham because people with Abraham wind up being blessed. So that's how that story ends. We're going to pick up at 22. I'd like you to read 22 through 26, so much less this time. And that'll be sort of Isaac's story. Isaac, Isaac doesn't get a lot of attention, but uh, but some important stuff in there. Thanks for your help, everyone.